Show me Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Sure Look, Sure Listen, the podcast that takes a pop at culture. Sure Look, Sure Listen. 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 Sure, look at Ben. This week we're taking a look at whether a hero like Batman should or shouldn't perform oral sex on a lady. We're also, Ben, looking at, I think, what you've sent me is a parody of a Nicolas Cage film. And also, there's been an episode of Loki Season 2. We'll probably do a review of it. Sure, listen, Michael, if that wasn't enough, we have a bloody guest. A bloody guest? Yeah, it's the man who reads more fantasy novels than any other man in Dublin. It's Connor. Hi, Connor. Hello, all. That's uh, it's, it's quite a reputation to live up to. I, yeah, uh, it is. I will try my best. <laughs> I would like to see the Guinness Book of Records adjudication on this man. Yeah, I, <laughs> ben, I, I didn't think you were going to leave me in like that. I'm not going to lie. I, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Being... The man who reads more fantasy novels than your average Dublin denizen. Is that better? Yeah, slightly. Yeah, that's okay. probably, slightly. probably true. Benjamin, are we talking about fantasy novels today? We're going to be looking at all things fantasy, Michael. We're going to be taking a look at a little bit of the history of the genre, Michael. A little bit of the modern versus the classic in the fantasy genre, Michael. Yep. What even makes a good bloody fantasy novel, Michael? Very what even good, makes yeah. one? Excellent. Um, Benjamin, as you know, I hate books. You do? I hate them. Indeed. I'm not reading Dragonlance, Ben. I don't care how important it is to you. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't, Michael. No, boo to Dragonlance. Boo to Dragonlance. Boo to Dragonlance. Down with that sort of thing. As you were saying earlier, Ben, <laughs> when even is Straight Pride Month? Uh, no, I was not saying that. I think you were. You were saying that earlier, weren't Absolute you? Absolute prick. <laughs> <laughs> I was not saying that I bloody in gotcha. any form. I got no, you, you didn't. I got That's you. I got you win. good. I got you good, Ben. Benjamin. <laughs> what? What's, what's your what? take? What's your take on fictional characters providing oral sex? This is all a. This is this is gas, Michael. This controversy around Batman and Catwoman. Because fill, fill us in, Ben. So uh, Ben, we found Ben. Out... Ben, one. Use the power of your mouth and tongue to fill us in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> boo, <laughs> boo! Shame on you. We're going to handle this in a mature and responsible manner. Um. So uh, we found out in the the middle of June, the showrunners for the Harley Quinn animated series uh, from DC Comics. Uh, came out they've been renewed for season three much to the delight of uh, many a fan uh, myself included quite enjoy mm. that show and we heard then <laughs> the showrunners explained that there was only one scene that they were made to cut uh, from the season three of the show and that's a, a scene in which uh, batman is seen kind of uh, coming back up from uh, from going down on catwoman and they mm. were told no we can't do that and to which the showrunners went but why? <laughs> but Benjamin, so he was coming back up from finishing. He wasn't like just down there going. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, he was. He was finishing. The, he was finished. He was wiping off his beard, going and getting some beard <laughs> shampoo, giving it a little rinse. Does Batman nice. have a beard now? No. Oh, okay. No, just a, <laughs> anyway, just a dishcloth. Wiping the little face down with the dishcloth. <laughs> the internet has, in classic fashion, Michael, taken this and and run a mile with it. Um, and it's it started a whole debate on you know <laughs> what a hero should do in a comic and stuff like that. It's just very strange. There's lots of different tacts. Val Kilmer's weighed in. Oh yeah, Val Kilmer performs Cunnilingus on anyone. <laughs> Zach Schneider has weighed in. Um, there's been responses from lots of people in the Batman world. Benjamin. Yeah. Now, I'm interested to hear, you've, you're telling me these people have weighed in. Which side are they weighing in on? On the Batman definitely would side. He definitely would. Even Zack Snyder. Even Zachary Schneider. Ah. Oh, which is surprising. I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. give you that. I would have thought he would say, I'm afraid of women, keep them away from me. Keep them away from me. <laughs> Only if I can have them in slow motion at 60 mm. frames per second. Um... Yeah, look, it's it's a bit silly, really, isn't it? It's like the it's like the bat dick controversy a couple of years ago when they published Batman's uh, member in a in Batman Damned, if you recall that, Michael. I do. We also have we have an episode there in our history somewhere where we talk about uh, Batman's dimensions. Oh no, Benjamin, and yeah. uh, where do you come down on this matter? <laughs> I think it's a ridiculous thing in the first place. <laughs> let him do what he wants. <laughs> let, let Batman do what he wants. But Ben, Batman's not a real person is the issue here. 
Yeah, but like, so exactly. So why is it an issue? Well, like, I, does I it suppose, matter? I suppose the issue is, I don't think there's anyone who'd argue that Batman would do it or not. Because he'd well, definitely well, do it. He'd probably the internet learned, disagrees with you firmly. <laughs> he probably learned it, Ben, from some sort of mystical kind of linguists in Nepal. Yes, because he had to, he had to, you know, master all forms, my friend. Yeah, he probably had to defeat Ra's al Ghul using only his tongue muscles. Probably, he probably, so, yeah, that makes no, sense. There's, there's little doubt, Ben, that he'd be a master at the old... Uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying is, it's the fact that they're depicting it. It's whether it's depicted. I mean, for example, I'm sure Wonder Woman poops. Yes, but it's not in the TV show. Yeah, but they're not going to like cut away to Wonder Woman having a poop in the movie. Probably not. <laughs> because, you know, it's not I I think the the I think the con I actually understand the controversy a little bit, and I think the controversy is more about it's not about whether they would do it if they were real people. It's whether or not it should be depicted. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine it was in a humorous scene. Oh, but the the entire tone of the the Harley Quinn animated show is humorous. There's, so there's perhaps, no... the, like, I'm not defending that Batman wouldn't blah, 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 because of course he would, Ben. He'd be amazing at it. But maybe they went, oh, look, lads, you're, I know you're doing a joke about Batman, but can we not do, do can we not do sex jokes about Batman? It's nothing sacred. It's <laughs> nothing sacred. Is there, <laughs> is there not one thing? That we could have. Were they going to be in the in the the costumes, Ben? That's what I'd be interested. That's to know. that's what I'd be interested to know. That's uh, what Michael. I'd be interested to see. Uh, what, no, Tom, no. Tom King has run into that controversy as well. Tom My friend King, Tom King, the, not your friend Tom King, the bloody DC scribe Tom King. Oh, very good. Uh, he ran into that controversy as well because he's spent an inordinate amount of time building up the bat and cat relationship. Um, mm. In his comics, it's an obsession. They have a, a their own mini series at the minute called Batman Catwoman. Um, and he got into a lot of trouble um, in a scene where a Batman says, keep the costumes on. Mm, um, and delicious. they do it on a rooftop. So it's it's all a bit silly. Because it's Benjamin, that was, that was famously the only way that Night Owl could get a, a manner, a, what's it called? A man reaction. A man reaction, yeah. is that what it's called? Stolen that scientific from Scientific term. Yes. Um, Remember in, in the film and the comic book Watchmen, Ben, Nightwing was a very flaccid boy. Until they by Zachary the Schneider, by Zachary Schneider, but also Alan Moore, and there's nothing wrong with him. He's never put no. anything <laughs> weird in a comic, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what we're getting at. Maybe sure. Look, I I think the internet's just blown it massively out of proportion. I think it, if it's if it's a matter of depiction and whether or not it fits the show tonally, I I think it probably spares the show from drifting fully into maybe Family Guy territory or something like that. Um, but I don't know. It's it's a it's a big debate. In terms of depiction, it's a reasonable request. In terms of the debate that it's caused on the internet, it's just a bit silly. Um, very good, Ben. Very good. I would really enjoy seeing the um. I know it's a series, but I would really enjoy in comic form seeing the speech bubble they put above Batman whenever he's coming up from his uh his act and what sequence of letters they eventually put together to describe what he's just done. But especially with Catwoman. Especially, yeah. <laughs> my mind is racing, Ben. Not only with imagery, but also with oh, puns. There's, there's two of you on my podcast now. This is terrible. Um, <laughs> the mind goes, Ben. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna interrupt you there, Ben. Two of us on whose podcast? Sorry, on my podcast. My, <laughs> what was that? my podcast when you're being crude and vile. What was um, that now? <laughs> Benjamin, look. Anyway, yes. doesn't matter. It's all irrelevant. What really matters is <laughs> you've sent me and Connor a bloody thing, and we've watched it, Ben, and I still don't believe it's real. <laughs> it is real. <laughs> it's coming. Um, so, uh, that's Michael, what, Ben, that's what Catwoman <laughs> said. Oh, boo, <laughs> boo! We had just gotten out of it. No, um, back in, straight back in. Yeah, straight back in. Uh, so, ben, what happened there? Ben, like that. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much for being on the show this week, Connor. We really appreciate yeah. you taking the time. That's it from us this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, no, uh, Michael, it's it's the return of our favourite segment. What is Nicolas Cage up to now? What's he doing? Um, so, Michael, it would appear, mm. it would appear yeah. that Nicolas Cage went a couple of years ago and saw a man lose his dog mm. 
and then go on a rampage through an unnamed city yes. to take out a bunch of mobsters and gangsters. Mm-hmm. That film was called John Wick. Jonathan Wickles. I assume, Michael, that mm. Nicolas Cage was in the cinema for a double bill, possibly with a dual screening of the classic film Babe. Very good. I see what you've done. I enjoyed it. And I assume, Michael, yes. that like Nicolas Cage is most of the time, he was on a copious amount of drugs. Lots of drugs, Ben. Ro- Lots hypno- of drugs. Rohypanol. Rohypanol. Um, and I would say he's out of his bloody mind. And he probably came out of that going, yes, I will make a film about a pig and I will save it. Um, that's not my best impression, but I'm going to stick with it. So I this, <laughs> this seems to be, yes. Michael... Yes. A fusion of the film Babe, Ratatouille, and John Wick. <laughs> doesn't make any fucking sense. It doesn't ben, make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. He's playing cinema's second most dangerous chef. Yes, after <laughs> Casey Ryback. Steven Seagal in Under Siege. Yeah, Casey Ryback. Uh, <laughs> He's the goddamn I'm chef. I'm glad we have the same reference for dangerous chef. <laughs> um, that makes me very happy. So... What we get in the first scenes of this trailer is is uh, John Wick, <laughs> but with a truffle pig. He's got a truffle pig, Ben. Ben, yeah. as you well know, it is my lifelong ambition to retire to the south of France and become a truffle hunter and have pigs. Yes, that has been your dream since I've known you. Yes, and Benjamin, I mean, everyone loves truffle pigs. But... Do, do they? Yeah, 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 truffle pigs are a good, good bunch of lads. What I worry about in this film is... Is he a chef or an assassin? Because there's no implication in the trailer that he's going to go and kill everyone. He's, he's just a chef assassin. Is he though? I don't know. I don't know if he's just a madman that's going around to establish me saying, give me my truffle pig. Hmm. Give him to me now. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know, Michael. I I would be very entertained to see how on earth he's balanced his career as a finesse chef and assassin at and the same assassin. time. It doesn't make any sense, Ben. It makes no sense at all. And it looks like that evil chef has stolen the pig. Yes, the evil, oddly, oddly Scandinavian slash German chef. He seems to be playing a Hans Gruber type. Do you think they're going to threaten to eat the pig? They wouldn't. I think they have to. Do you, do you, uh, but why do you think that? Explain. I, I, I think I was saying this to you earlier that I think because Hollywood can't get away with just fridging women anymore, they're basically replacing them with animals. <laughs> like, we, we, John Wick was the start of it, but uh, you had Love and Monsters as well, where they kind of did the same thing. They just constantly put the dog in danger. Very bad. Yeah. Also, and very bad. Chaos walking. Yeah. And now I think Nick Cage, I don't give him as much credit. I think he just saw John Wick and he was just like... <laughs> Make the dog a pig and then just <laughs> went that way. And I, I think they will have to put the pig in danger because it's the only way they can generate emotion because no one cares about Nick Cage in trouble. My feeling on it is, first of all, I completely agree, Connor. I am not a big fan of the animals in danger genre mm. that is starting to appear. I have no yeah. time for it. I don't like that you've equated women with pigs. I think that is a bad take, Connor. <laughs> I have to say. Right, that was Ben's suggestion. I, mine was the first part, I swear. Ben, leave it out. It's no use. It's <laughs> Benjamin. Get on with it. What was I saying? <laughs> I've lost the track of what I agree I with saying. Connor. I agree. You don't like the emerging don't animals like in the, peril. Yes, don't like it. But my feeling on this is it looks like the famous chef wants the truffles. And Nicolas Cage has the best goddamn truffle pig in the world. In the biz. Uh. Yeah. So they're stealing them so they can get the truffles. Yeah, that does sound about right, doesn't it? It's hard to get a good truffle pig, Ben, because it's it's easy enough to get a pig that can find truffles. But what you'll find is that most pigs will eat the truffles on you. So most people have moved away from truffle pigs to truffle dogs because dogs aren't Uh too pushed by the taste of truffles, whereas pigs find them absolutely delicious. Can't get enough of them, Michael. Literally can't get enough of them, Ben. And And you're basically just following the pig around, seeing them running away in the ground like Batman, and then saying, get away from there before he eats the the truffle. The truffle. Uh, this is all in your extensive research to become a truffle farmer. Uh, that's not hey, a joke. Yeah, I'm, not doing, I'm not doing a joke about truffles. I'm mad about truffles. No, I know. <laughs> you're mad about truffles and you're going to retire to the south of France, south of France to become a truffle hunter. A <laughs> called ben. ben the pig. 
and then one day, Michael, yes. someone is going to steal your Ben the Pig. Yeah. And you're going to go on a hunt to Dublin City in different restaurants, only there won't be that many Michelin star restaurants. You'll probably be dropping into Supermax going, where's my pig? Now, hold on a second. I'm going to take offence there on behalf of the Dublin gastronomic scene. Oh, here we go. Dublin has become a very cosmopolitan and modern city and a place to get great food, Benjamin. How very dare uh-huh. you? You take your uh-huh. you take your 1990s attitude and you get back out of here to your straight pride parade. And you... <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you here anymore. Eastern no. Europe will have you, Ben. <laughs> oh, see, that's that's one of those moments where it's just very sad and true, and this is like, oh, what are we doing? Oh. Anyway, look, Western society is in decline. It looks like Western a parody. Yeah. In it looks like a parody. It looks like a parody of a Nicolas Cage film. It, it looks ridiculous. Um, so, in, in an update, yes, uh, what 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 even is Nicolas Cage doing these days? He's truffle hunting. Truffle hunting with a pig. With a truffle hunting. With a Did pig. anybody see Five Nights at Nicolas Cage at Freddy's? I, I never went to have a look at it. I, I kind of enjoy looking at the trailers more than I do actually going to see the film. I think it's better. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, ladies and gentlemen, we did a review of it. Well, we did a little trailer reaction to what seemed to be an adaptation of the game Five Nights at Freddy's starring mm. one Nicolas Cage as a badass janitor. Um, yeah, and I think that came out and it came and went. And it, yeah, it was, it was a thing. Um, as will this. As will this. I might go see it, Michael, just to just to wonder at what I've done with my life. You won't. Um, you haven't even seen A Quiet Place 2, Benjamin. I will. I, I haven't seen A Quiet Place 1, Michael. Um, I have not seen A Quiet Place. Because I'm not a quiet man, Michael. I'm very loud. Yes. I'm very loud. I don't like quiet places. Mm. Um, Michael, do you know what came out and we missed completely? Go on. Wild Mountain Time. I know it came out. Yeah, it came out, the bastards. They just it. snuck it in the back door. <laughs> they, just, they just snuck it out after the controversy. They were like, oh, we'll just, we'll just put it out to rent there. Yeah, yeah it's thirteen ninety nine if you want to. Go Completely on, have missed it. it. Have you seen it? No, I haven't. I haven't. I, I, don't, I daren't. Uh, ben, I think. Ben, go on. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't seen it either. Did you know, on a similar <laughs> note, that yeah. Disenchanted, the sequel to Enchanted, is currently filming just up the road? Yes, just up the road in Wicklow Town. In Wicklow, it's not Wicklow Town. It's Enniscorty. Enniscary. Not Wicklow Town. Enniscary. Oh, yeah. Enniscary. Um, yeah, let's go see it. Let's get. Let's become extras, the three of us. Oh, can you imagine? We could be there three of the seven dwarfs in a ruffled <laughs> collar. Um, that that'd be good. Let's do that. All right, let's, let's go. go. Get parts. Let's go raid it. Hello, we're moderate to poor podcasters. Let us be in your film, please. Um, that'd be good. We'll plug it. Let's let's do that. We'll we'll plug it on our on our wide listenership. Sure, look, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's time to bloody move on, Benjamin. What are we talking about? What's going on, Michael? The fuckery. Oh yes, your the favorite. fuckery returns. Um, so as as usual, we've had the audacity, we've had the timidity, and now we've got the fuckery. Loki episode two came out this uh, Wednesday, Michael, and uh, we got we got the big reveal. Don't don't, <laughs> don't do it. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it before doing. I haven't the done it yet. Break. Oh, I haven't done my little spoiler break. Okay, hang on. Spoilers. Spoilers. If you're watching Loki, turn it off now. Not Loki. No, don't tell people to turn the podcast off, Ben. Skip ahead now. That's better, yeah. That better? Nice. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we got Loki episode two, uh, and we're going to do full spoilers from here on out. Uh, Connor, you have seen it, just to double check. I have. I, I watched both last night. I watched one, listened to your review, and then watched two, so I could slightly more understand it um i enjoyed it but i i have some issues but i'll, I'll let you okay, go first we'll and then i'll those. i'll uh, oh. air my grievances so this uh this saw loki uh fully adapting to his catch me if you can persona hmm. um where he plays leonardo dicaprio in a big inter interdimensional time agency um and we get a little bit of the the classic loki he tries to pull a, a classic loki jape and trick them all into doing silly things. And does it work, Michael? No. Owen Wilson's like, cut it out. He's too clever. Or Give it, it out. Owen Wilson's too clever. Mm. Such ben- a clever man. Benjamin, yes. I felt they should have called it Loki Episode 2, Loki's Got a Job. <laughs> Loki's Got a Job. <laughs> Loki's just, learning the ropes. He's sitting at a desk doing some work. Yep, just putting in the putting in the graft, Michael. Putting mm. in the graft. Yeah. Um, 
sorry, he's just covered in paperwork and bureaucracy and red tape, Michael, and he's, he's trying to make his way in the world. Um, we get a little bit of we get a little bit of a, a grain of what the show is going to become. Um, Loki using his intellect and kind of detective skills to figure out that it's oh, it's an apocalypse. He's hiding in apocalypses. Um, and it's pretty interesting. There's there's a very heavy handed thing of like he 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 oh. and that makes the the big reveal all the more like what except that it's very clearly i think from build um a woman in a lot of the scenes where we see the hooded figure um i don't know for me it was kind of obvious because we weren't getting to see a glimpse of face or side pro any hooded figure now i always kind of assume it's the opposite gender to what i was led to believe mm. um i'm in just real like life. ah in real yeah, life, no, as not in, in real life. In, in <laughs> television, in television. Um, so we got revealed. It's Lady Loki. So all the all the debate we could have had, Michael, about oh, what's the variant? Is it King Loki? Is it uh, World Breaker Loki? Is it any of the other ones? We'll never know. Benjamin. Yeah. Shut up for a second, though, because you keep calling okay. her Lady Loki, and she very much said, "Don't call me that." Yes, she said to call her Randy. Did she? That's that's the name on the the guy's jacket that she's possessing at one point. No, no, no. Like, when you... when she meets, when she meets him as Loki, as the lady, doesn't oh, she as say, the lady "Don't Loki. call me Loki"? Oh, was that? It was that. Did she say that? I missed yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I I thought it was earlier in the in the scene. No, no. She's um, like, "Don't you call me Loki, you son of a bitch." Yes, son of a bitch. <laughs> so she's a very different type of variant. Um. Because we were all expecting, I would have enjoyed seeing Tom Hiddleston versus Tom Hiddleston, and it would have been very much in the the universe of WandaVision to see a Marvel character take on himself have a in a big role. Um, just a bit of a Paul Bethany moment, a Vision versus Vision ship of Theseus moment. But yeah, so we got introduced to this character, very different power set to the Loki that we know. Um, some Scarlet Witch moves there at the beginning with mm, the old possession so. and. Yeah. And that kind of thing. She seems to be able to possess multiple people and herself. So it doesn't take a lot of concentration for her because she possesses the the different humans throughout the thing. And she's seen setting the bombs while they're chatting to Loki. Um, so the two possibilities. Either there's more than one variant or um, she's able to control people and, and do things at the same time. Which, you know, she, makes sense as you go I, I think we only ever see her controlling one person then. Uh, yes, at a time, but yeah. she can do things while that person is being controlled, so she can split her mm. her actions between herself and the the possessed individual. And it seems that she can possess anybody. There doesn't seem to be a limit um, to who she can possess. Like the timekeepers are just as vulnerable as regular human folks. Um, so we we got a lot of other interesting tips. I think a lot of big Marvel theorists are are losing their minds at the minute because the the timeline has been kaboomed, kablooied. You kablooied it. Um. Yeah. And uh, we see a list of the the key events. Somebody screenshotted this oh, naturally. And, oh, I haven't seen this. And yeah. Oh, so don't go on. on. Let, me, let me get that up there. Oh, this is um, exciting. Is one of them so, Agents of Shield season six and seven? <laughs> yes, it's just gone now, Michael. Yes. Um, <laughs> the television on, show me... Inhumans, is that gone? Probably. Probably that as well. Very good. Um, hang on, I'm going to find that. So I'm going to let one of you fine gentlemen jump in with your thoughts on it so far. Connor, you said you had some, some thoughts and reactions to it there. So why don't you? Yeah, I, I suppose my main issue with it so far is just that. And I think Black Widow is going to possibly run into the same thing. Is that? I think it's very hard to build momentum in something that is not in the, I, th I think they call it the sacred timeline. Mm. So uh, this kind of, to me, has to be a self-contained story. And I'm not as big of a, a Hiddleston, I think they call Hiddleston. Hiddleston. They, yeah. they, uh, a lot of people are. So I I do find the show interesting and I really like um, Owen Wilson's character. I just have a bit of an issue about where it's all going to go to. And I just read before this that they've actually uh, there's a season two in development, which Ooh. to me makes not a lot of sense if this is going to be self-contained. So I'm not sure how they're going to if they bring him back into the the, the sacred timeline, it kind of removes a bit of Thor's um, character development and mm. point. Yeah. So I'm I, and I think the writing is a bit heavy. I think you mentioned this last week. I think sometimes I I I can almost guarantee that scene where he's explaining his two different powers in great detail is some sort of Chekhov's power thing that will happen later in the show. I just thought that was a bit heavy handed and there's there's certain things that I'm just not on board with it so far. Mm. Mm. My, I, 
I I think the my main concern about it, where it's going to go, is it's being built up as this changes everything. This changes the whole world. This you you're not everything's going to be different after this. Bloody Catwoman's going to be going down on Batman after this. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be reverse world, and everything's going to be topsy turvy. But also, you're going to be, still be able to go to the cinema and enjoy the films if you haven't seen this. And also, there's going to be a season two of this, and there's going to be a season two of WandaVision, and there's going to be a season two of how many Captain Americas are there? So how can it change everything, but also yeah. reestablish the status quo? And that's the same when any kind of long form, and we might get to this later, <laughs> when any long form media decides to do something world changing. Uh, especially in the in the genre of shared universes and comics, anytime yeah. you do something world changing, you have to undo it. I mean, the real brave balls move would have been to not bring back the people who died in Infinity War. I mean, I think that would have been genius. That would have been insane. That would have changed everything. Yeah, it would have been. So th- this is this is an interesting debate that we have. I have that list here, but since we're we're on this, it's pretty interesting. There's a lot of debate on on what the TVA means for the future of Marvel, uh, Connor. As you pointed out, it's very difficult to see how this moves out of its own weird little mm. bubble narrative. Do you know what I mean? But we've we've argued. Owen Wilson has a little chat with uh, Loki at one point, and he explains why he does what he does, and he goes order. Uh, and that might seem boring to you, but, you know, at the end of the day, we get up and we walk away and we hang up our jackets and it's it's done. You know, we have order in the universe. The There's no multiverse because of the sacred timeline. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Except Agents so of S.H.I.E.L.D. season 7. Shh. It's gone. It's a variant. It's been wiped from existence. Hey! They, 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 didn't take a, they didn't take a ticket. Um, so... The theory is now, looking at the Multiverse of Madness, which is coming up with, uh, and we know Wanda is going to be in that from WandaVision, there's a theory, because Wanda is known as the the, the Chaos Witch, mm. or the, what was her name? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, okay, the yeah, Scarlet yeah. Witch, bringer yeah. of chaos. She is the TVA's worst nightmare, and this is the current running theory on the internet. She's the TVA's like worst nightmare, because she can create from nothing. Um, so theoretically, she can cause splits on the timeline, uh, the retrieval of her children could be um, a huge branch <laughs> off the timeline that they can't erase because they can't stop uh, Wanda. And that will lead to multiverse theory. And Loki, uh, Lady Loki, for lack of a better term, is going to bring back the multiverse herself. And it's going to be a whole thing in Multiverse of Madness. Fucking bollocks, Ben. Okay, go Absolute on. Absolute bollocks. <laughs> What's going Tell to happen why. is, at the end of this series, we're going to find out that the TVA isn't as big and all-important as it seemed, and that the Timekeepers weren't as all-powerful, or just didn't even flat out exist. And the whole thing is going to be not that important. Okay, fair enough. Well, well, we'll we'll wait and see on that one. We'll very, see, Benjamin. Uh, very quickly to run through the locations on the list that yes, have been affected do. by the Kablooey moment. Uh, Niflheim, Asians and um, Shield season seven. Yes, that's gone now. Uh, Niflheim is targeted in the past. Nowhere is targeted in the past. Uh, Voromir is targeted in the oh. past. So, are we going to get Black Widow back in the Marvel Benjamin. universe because of a variant? Benjamin. Um, yes. Shut up for a second. Go on now. Are they all places where the Infinity Stones were? They seem to be places where Infinity Stones were. So was Loki stopping Captain America then? It's a great question. I don't know. Mm, we don't. We don't, Ben. I bet you it turns are, out. To are we going to get Steve idea. Rogers through the timeline battling no. Loki over no, and over? No, Ben. Stop yes, we are. Setting us it's up for happen. disappointment. Uh, yes, we are. And then Mephisto's going to step in. It's going to oh. kick everything off. Um, what's his name with the bendy arms? Um, uh, Reed Richards. Reed Richards. He'll be there. He's okay. the aerospace engineer. And <laughs> Got to recycle that one. Yeah. Can't put okay. Get it all in. Get everything in. <laughs> um, but they have dates next to each one, Michael. So um, it's Niflheim, and that was without a date. Nowhere was without a date. Unfortunately, Voromir was uh, with the date of 2301. Uh, so it's way beyond when mm. Scarlet Witch and... Um, Black Widow were there, or not Scarlet Witch, then <laughs> Gamora Scarlet Johansson. And... You're thinking of Scarlet, Scarlet Johansson. Johansson. Yes, I'm mixing up my Scarlets. Yeah. Um, Asgard is 2004. Um, so that's long before 
any of the events of the Thor films. Um, Sakaar is 1984. Mm. Um, Ego is also visited. Mm. Um, and that's in 1832 uh, when that happens. One of the really interesting things is Titan um, is mentioned. So Titan is where Thanos is from. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's 1982. Um, that's when I'm from. That's when you're from. Yeah. Exactly. Look at you. Um, Hala is mentioned, which is the Cree uh, homeworld, the Cree capital. Uh, Xandar is mentioned, which we saw in Guardians of the Galaxy. That's in 1001. No. Um, Jotunheim, where Loki is from, is mentioned as well. It doesn't get a date. And then there's a whole load of Earth locations. So there's Rome in 1390, Lisbon in 1492, uh, Phong Nha in Vietnam in 1522, Barcelona in 1540, uh, Thornton, USA in 1551, and so on and so forth. So there's lots of different events. So if I had hours, Michael, I'd sit down there and see what, what mattered in any of those moments, but I don't. Yes, Mick. Yeah, ben, there was no there. Thornton, USA in 1592. Well, <laughs> I know what to tell you. <laughs> what does that even mean? I don't know what to tell you. Maybe maybe it's... I, I, I don't know what to tell you, but... Uh, fuck it, know. look, Ben. It's all someone's fantasy. Sure, look at your fuck it. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? It's all someone's fantasy, Michael. It's funny you should mention that. Um, very well done there, Michael. Very smooth. Smooth as butter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies yes. and gentlemen. I'm not reading Dragonlance. I'm not going to do it. I'm not reading it. I'm not reading it. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. So uh, the world of fantasy literature, Michael, is arguably the reason that we have a lot of the stuff that we have today um, and the, the reason that a lot of our podcast exists today and that's probably going to get me in trouble somewhere along the line but I think it's a fair argument I think the the fantasy genre in literature um, you know it, it has a lot of different names swords and sorcery um, I can't think of any others off the top of my head Very there good, that was yeah. excellent work um, Ben there's swords and sorcery there's high fantasy there's low high fantasy <laughs> <laughs> a bit of modern fantasy urban fantasy exactly yeah um, steampunk your favorite there's oh, i hate steampunk <laughs> jesus christ um we have sci fantasy which we'll get into a little bit later um but michael we said to ourselves isn't it about time that someone sat down and got to the bottom of all this and then we did a quick google search and we found that loads of people already had Very good. um that's but we wanted to have connor us. on as, <laughs> yeah we wanted to have connor on as a guest so we said fuck it uh we'll do it anyway um so today, yes, that's what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. That's what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to have a look at a lot of different things. Primarily, we're going to have a little brief history of the fantasy genre, where it comes from. Um, we thought we'd take a look at the primary aspects of fantasy. So what goes into making a bloody good fantasy book? All right. Um, we take a look at the, the, the ever-raging debate of modern versus classic fantasy. Um, and then we thought we'd finish off, Michael. Yes. With some bloody recommendations. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, it sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like a, a, a tasty little episode. So let's get into not, it. As long as it's not Dragonlance. I was going to say, I've just removed it. Don't worry. No mention <laughs> here after. <laughs> Dragonlance will not feature on this Hastily podcast. reworking my notes. I'm just going to look up Dragonlance while you two get, get started. <laughs> I have no idea what it is. Neither so, do I. It's the, such a strange thing to be. <laughs> I don't know where Mick got it from. Where did you even pull that from? I don't know. I don't even know if it exists. I'm going to look it up now. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so while he's doing that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here and explain the the roots of the fantasy genre. Kind of in it, and we should probably stress here that most of what we're talking about today is Western fantasy. Um, I I don't have much of a frame of reference for anything outside of that. Um, so I'm gonna be sticking to that. So I have a little bit of a history of of the roots of Western fantasy and where it might come from. So. Monsters and creatures and ghouls and the heroes that rise up to fight them are, are nothing new. We've kind of seen them all over the place um, throughout the years. The earliest example that we have in what we would define as English literature would probably be Beowulf, which is Old English. Um, mm, sexy and, Angelina and, Jolie. She's sexy in the water and she's uh, creepy and sexy. Uh, yeah, sure, Michael. <laughs> sure thing, bud. Um, so the, the original tale of Beowulf versus Grendel, which then became Beowulf versus Grendel's mum, um, is is kind of a... It's one that I'm not going to say everybody knows because I don't think that's a fair assumption, but it's one that uh, a lot of people who'd be familiar with fantasy would kind of know. And it's the first big hero narrative in early English or old English. And it features Beowulf, 
who goes up against Grendel, who's a monster who's terrifying a local community, takes him on, gives him an L bash. Mm. Um, and then his mum, in typical fashion, goes, uh, my little fellow wouldn't hurt a hair on anyone's head. Get away from him. Um, and she comes out and she has a go at him as well. She turns into a big bloody dragon. Big sea and monster. he has to fight a dragon. Big sea monstery dragon thing. A worm um, in kind of classic medieval texts, even though it's not medieval. But anyway, then, Michael, uh, that evolved and we kind of saw more fantastic elements being added in, almost par for the course, um, in Arthurian legend, and that would have been the 13th century. Um, that's where the swords element comes in, sorcery. We had Merlin. Um, again, we had strange creatures. The Green Knight is one of the most fantastical kind of elements of Arthurian legend. We're going to see that turned into a film by A24 very soon, starring Dev Patel, Michael. It's very exciting. It's on its way out. I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be really good. Um, and then, Michael, where entire kind of... Sorry, Michael and Connor. Sorry, I'm so used to just <laughs> drumming in to, to Mick. Um, but Excuse me? Where we... Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what was that? I kind of drifted off there, but what did you just say? <laughs> that's a very suggestive choice of words. That's, that's my mistake. Um, it's all that talk at the start of the podcast, Michael. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, where we kind of start building whole fantasy worlds as opposed to kind of elements of the fantastic within our world oh. is with the fairy queen. Um, and that's a, that's a really terrible um, kind of long form poem from the, the 16th century by a guy called Edmund Spencer. And Edmund Spencer was like a very sycophantic Shakespeare. Um, he wrote for the court of Queen Elizabeth and the, fairy queen is written about queen elizabeth she's the the fairy queen and it's a very sycophantic kind of poem um about how wonderful and powerful and you know great she is think galadriel um if she had like an army of simps um <laughs> and that's uh, that's kind of what you're looking at you know what i mean i think galadriel does have an army of simps. <laughs> an army of simps. that's her whole thing isn't it and then she's like ah, i was evil <laughs> the whole bloody time um, <laughs> So that, that kind of saw that. And then th that uh, dropped out a little bit um, with the Age of Enlightenment. The, the, the whole kind of frivolity and fantasy of literature was then looked down upon by the Age of Reason and people like Immanuel Kant. What a proper Kant. Oh. Um, and yeah, they kind of went, oh, what's that? Fantastical elements in your literature. How gauche. Um, and they How said, bourgeois. boo. Uh, down with how bourgeois how do you expect to elevate your your mind to humanism if you're going to be bloody talking about monsters and fantasy things and everyone had a really dreary time for about a century and they're like oh this is a bit shit isn't it mm. where's, where's the banter bring uh, back what the do vampires I read? <laughs> yeah exactly and they're like what do i read to my kids like how, how am i supposed to have a how am i supposed to get them off to bed with this bloody uh you need to educate yourself and raise yourself above the sphere that you were born in you're like oh mom i'm sick of hearing about spheres give me a dragon yeah. um and so in the 1800s we saw a huge um fairy tale resurgence um people like hans christian anderson uh the brothers Grimm were republished um and lots of different countries kind of reinvigorated their old fairy tales. It's a huge moment in terms of the transition from folklore and oral histories and oral tales where we used to, you know, talk about, uh, you'd have different variations of the story from teller to teller. They might add their own thing in. Suddenly we had people writing them down and, and that really starts to shape how we tell these kinds of stories because there are fixed versions mm. um, all of a sudden. Because Ben, I... I read somewhere recently that essentially uh, the the story of Arthur Arthur Arthurian legend it was basically the world's first fan fiction. Kind of, yeah. That's I, that's not that's not a bad theory. Do you really want to expand on it there? Actually, I I can't remember. I can't. I'm stealing it. And I don't like stealing other people's ideas, especially if I can't um, remember where I read it. But it was something along the lines of basically there's no canon to this. These aren't, the King Arthur things aren't novels. They're just a collection of stories and people wrote them over history and like a hundred years later, someone came along and wrote their version of it. And then a hundred years later, someone came along and wrote their version. Who am I stealing this from? I'm so sorry if I'm stealing this. And it's basically like um, the, the trying to look at the King Arthur mythos as compared to like a modern family myth, uh, modern family, modern fantasy <laughs> mythos. It's like trying to look at Sherlock Holmes, but at the same time including 
Enola Holmes, the Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. one, yeah. the Benedict Cumberbatch one. I'm trying to, you can't coalesce that into a world because yeah, too it many homes spoil the broth. It, it's a really interesting point, I think, and it's kind of the the difference between folklore and mythology versus modern fantasy in that like you're saying um a lot of mythology would have been passed down orally and then you would have i know it's ben's favorite word and By then, Batman, uh, most likely. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's also, what he was doing <laughs> but uh also they're they're not really concerned with like time or place it's kind of just happened long ago somewhere and there, there's no setting there's no maps to record it and then as you move into kind of more of a, a modern fantasy setting especially victorian period past that you've you've a lot more of a definitive author who controls the narrative it's their story and it has elements that they control if that's the magic system the world the the democracy within the world whatever it may be so it is kind of an interesting way it changes and i think the enlightenment age is kind of important for that because people started giving out about fantasy and kind of chastising it as a, a child's genre it kind of means it is a genre then because i suppose you can only give out about something that's actually there so by the people acknowledging it it becomes its own thing and then it can actually grow properly which is like like when people complain about our cosplay videos on the internet exactly and they're yes. like ah but by by giving out about them you've admitted that they're a thing this is it exactly <laughs> yes there is no such thing as bad publicity it's the jack sparrow principle ah but you have heard of me exactly. um and it's a it's a whole thing um so then i suppose we, we get two significant works um that come out of that kind of 1800s fairy tale resurgence which could be looked on as like really early prototypes for fantasy novels and those two things are undine which is very much a children's story and um, but it's about a, a kind of princess of the forest and her adventures in a forest and as opposed to a series of like an anthology where you have a series of different characters doing things this is one character in a fairy tale setting that continues through and it's very much designed for children to entertain kind of help them along and then what we have then is another uh set of tales called Sintram and his companions um mm. and i had no idea what this was um when i was looking it up um but this was published in 1814 and it was by a guy called i'm gonna definitely get this wrong but it's it's friedrich de la motte fouque <laughs> um, uh, by, by by the looks of it um yeah. and yeah it's it's an interesting kind of knightly fantasy um Sintram and his companions are an early prototype for the Fellowship of the Ring, for example. Um so Sintram would be your Aragorn character, and that's the goal that he's kind of working towards. Now again, it's almost an anthology. It's very similar to Undine in that it's a series of different tales within the same universe with the same characters. Um so these are the two early things that come. But then what really gives us the what really pushes the fantasy genre forward is the gothic period of literature that came, as Connor said, in the Victorian period. Um, and that's this huge moment where it's like, oh, so I can just write what I want, is it? With a little bit of with a little bit of human stuff. Can I can I throw a ghost in? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Throw that in there. Throw that in there. Um, oh, what about a what about an ancient civilization that nobody knows about? Oh yeah, get that in there. Get that in there. Uh, oh, what about an evil book? Oh, that sounds good. Write me a story about an evil book. Um, and they do loads of stuff like this. And that sees the the kind of huge move um, from very realistic things. Um, you know, the the novel, um, I think the author Brandon Sanderson put it as, uh, the novel back in the day was a series of boring stories about boring people doing boring things. And if that's what you want to write, cool. Um, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Take um, that, the soaps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so i mean there's there's a lot of argument to be made there's a lot of you know there's a lot of words slung around it you know from people in fantasy and people outside of fantasy at each other and it, it turns into a bit of a a shit fling contest on occasion pad, if you will yeah but there's there's two huge moments um that come with that dracula is one of them um and then uh Dr dracula is this huge moment where um, there's a big evil overlord and there's a band of people fighting against it. It's one long novelization. Um, it's a pistol. It, it's a, I'm going to get this wrong. Epistolary. I never get that right, but it's, it's written in a sequence. Oh, go ahead, Connor. Sorry. I was just going to say as well, I suppose a huge thing in the Victorian period for fantasy was the, um, rise of, um, Penny Dreadfuls and 
short stories that um, a lot of authors would submit to. And I think uh, Bram Stoker did this with um, the first bit of Dracula and Frankenstein as well, where you wanted people to buy your Penny Dreadful. So you would include supernatural elements in order to kind of grab people's attention quickly. Um, and I suppose just one other thing that's kind of important for the realm of fantasy in this time is people were a lot more religious and a lot less well-traveled. So while we call it fantasy today, to them, it was just really scary fiction. Like they, they weren't fully aware if it was fiction mm. or not, especially something like Dracula, mm. which I suppose is interesting when you're defining fantasy against, um, I suppose, just horror or something you're not used to. That's very interesting. I've met people who think that Transylvania is not a real place. Mm. yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's pretty common for people to think <laughs> nowadays everyone's like oh that's just something they made up for like australia it's just something they made up for um, <laughs> to for scare children to scare children yeah i mean if you, think about it, if you think about it a unicorn that's much more believable than a kangaroo yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um i suppose it's one of the things that takes place in a lot of those fantasy novels is um you would have a huge push in england and um western europe uh publishing fantasy stuff but it would always be set in transylvania eastern europe or um frankenstein for example takes place in the antarctic at one page or at one place yeah at one time so it's it would always be kind of a key part of um fantasy literature at that time was to set it in a place that people wouldn't be familiar with so anything could kind of go and it could be determined as realistic or not mm. that's very interesting i like it that's very i like it a lot I'm going to go because I think that's the nicest thing Mick will say. You were saying that Dracula was an Episcopalian. Uh, yeah, so uh, Pescatarian. Pescatarian. Yes, he's a Pescatarian. Um, <laughs> completely misunderstood in Victorian society. Um, so Dracula was a Pescatarian um, and he was really confused when people kept running away from him and throwing crosses at him. Um, he's just like, I just want fish. Um, but yeah, so th this has kind of come to dominate it as a thing, but you can see the kind of classic tropes, the big evil overlord. Now, it's not a big evil overlord in the classic sense, but it is a huge unstoppable evil uh, that it takes a lot to surmount. Now, it's it's heavily Christian in some of its telling. It's it's urban fantasy beyond anything else, um, and it has a lot of, you know, othering and xenophobic tendencies and things like that. So it's, it's you know, it's a little bit different. But Connor, that's an excellent point. Like, people would have read that at one point, and then any time they saw a lad from Transylvania, they would have been like, oh, Jesus is a vampire. Um, yeah, and, and you'll uh, notice is what you've kind of said it there as well, that a lot of uh, fantasy would have touched on, you would have had a lot of Faustian stuff and kind of stuff to do with Christian or religious mythology so that people would believe it a bit more, given that they were so scared of priests and church. Yes, yeah, big scary, big scary big, lads in churches big, and steeples. Scary man in church. Uh, Benjamin, so you yeah, put down here first fantasy fantasy novel, and then there's an equal sign, and then it's blank. Uh, sorry, I meant the two <laughs> steps underneath that. So there's 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 a oh, bit of a debate. that's disappointing. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so there's a bit of a debate about that, um, and one of the one of the things that we run into when we uh, look for the the first fantasy novel and it's fairly unfair to do this it's fairly it's a fairly dodgy practice to define any movement in literature as this is the moment mm. this is the time yeah it, it's it's a fairly dodgy practice and it gets you into all kinds of trouble because you're you're discounting some people and you're you're elevating other people unfairly and it's a whole thing but in terms of the first run through so not like undine not like Sintram, where you have a bunch of different tales in one collection this is one story in a completely separate world to our own okay one story in a completely separate world to our own that's almost entirely made up and there are two front runners for that so the one that gets uh, quoted quite often is called the world beyond the uh sorry the wood beyond the world um, by a guy called william morris and that was published in 1894 the cigarettes man uh, yes, William Morris, the cigarette man, also wrote fantasy in his spare time. Um, no, he didn't. How ridiculous. Um, no, it's not him. It's a different guy. But there was another novel before that, Michael, called The Princess and the Goblin. And it's a very, it's a, ch it's it's a children's good. book. It's a, is it good? It is. Uh, yeah, it's very, um, you can see how much fantasy is still inspired by mythology in those days. Um, I, I know I tried to keep away from spoilers, but uh, the goblin's weakness in it is that uh, if you stand on their feet, which is clearly just taken from Achilles' uh, the Achilles heel. Ooh, um, nice. th so there's, it's it's really fun to kind of read. It's probably the first, I think it's considered the first fantasy novel because you can start to trace a clear line from how fantasy has grown from there. But 
I suppose people are going to at me for that. So I'll, I'll well, uh, the, d- trace some of that line for us, Connor. I'd like to hear some of that li- line being traced. So, so you've a lot of the things, as Ben was kind of saying there, it, it's kind of considered the first fantasy novel to be written for adults. I know it sounds very childish, but at the time it would have been considered for adults. And uh, you've a lot of more, um, you've a lot of the kind of um, tropes that would take place in fantasy moving forward for about 100 years. So you had a created world um, you had the female in distress, unfortunately, which was slightly overused for a long time. Should have you just had... replaced her with a pig. Yeah. <laughs> you had the, the farm boy turned uh, hero, which would later become the chosen one trope a lot. Um, you'd the kind of uncaring parents, which allows all this to take place and it for it, it to be slightly more pos- plausible. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of consider it, if, if you read it and you have read any sort of modern fantasy you'll you'll notice the the line kind of tracing through it about how it could be considered the first fantasy novel well you're in good company in that assumption um connor because um c.s lewis J.R. tolkien all cite the the writer of that book a guy called uh george, george mcdonald. mcdonald yeah george mcdonald they they cite him as the the big influence in their own work um, and the other thing that makes it really significant, um, you mentioned earlier that w- when you when you reference something, you kind of define it and give it a chance to to grow as a concept. He wrote a famous essay, uh, a really famous essay among like hardcore fantasy fans, and I think it's called "Why Fantasy" or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, and he wrote that, and it, it's it, it's defining why this genre is necessary moving forward, why it deserves its own space um, in the literary world, and it's it's pretty. Have you read that as well, Connor? I haven't read it, but I do find it interesting. That's another, I suppose, true line he started is that, um, like to this day, George Orr Martin, um, most fantasy authors have some sort of essay or justification about why their genre should be allowed to exist in the time they're writing uh, and it's continued online as well i know ben you watch a bit of booktube like daniel green will yeah. regularly publish videos about why this genre should exist which i find kind of funny that something that probably outsells a lot of other genres has to still kind of justify its own existence within the world but i, I suppose yeah he started the first kind of real critical analysis of fantasy versus other works yeah so he's he's huge and i guess that that's a nice uh transition point for us to move into the mac daddy of the the modern uh fantasy genre and uh that's J.R. tolkien um j or or is it j or 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 j or tolkien yeah yeah j or tolkien um and he he comes out with the the hobbit and just ben, yes why doesn't he just pick one what, uh, <laughs> So what do you mean? Is it J just... or Or? Uh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's my contribution. Uh... <laughs> Back in the cave. I am done. Um, so he kind of, beyond anything that we've seen before, he is an exception to every publishing rule that went before. Um, J.R. Tolkien publishes The Hobbit. And I need to look up the date. Do you have the date, Connor, by any chance? The olden um, days. The Hobbit was first published in September 21st, 1937. Uh, September 21st, uh, 1937. Is that what you said? Yes. Ben, ben yeah. the listeners can hear Connor. Uh, sorry. No, I was, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was checking to, for myself. Sorry. You don't have to relay it for them. They can actually hear sorry. it. It would be I quite would, odd uh, if he was just like Jamie in the back room. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, can you pull up that date for me? Um, yeah, sorry, Connor. Um, so uh, that leads us into The Hobbit, and The Hobbit changes the perception of fantasy in terms of its wildfire success. Um, go ahead, Connor. No, I was just going to say, um, it's. I find it really interesting as well that um, in the wake of World War One and the wake of World War Two, um, fantasy book sales kind of increase um, dramatically and I think a lot of people attribute the success of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings later to that because I think escapism becomes a, more of a, a key thing in times when uh, history is not kind to people so it's I find it interesting that um, I think The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings kind of had this perfect storm of things going for it they're obviously fantastic books within their own right but um, like the runaway success that you get from them i think you have to look at so many different things that to attribute it to you were saying earlier connor that one of the kind of modern the the 
the things that define modern fantasy is world building, magic systems, maps. You know, yeah. this is our world. These are the rules of our world and this is what's going on in it. Now here come the stories. Yeah. And one of the big distinctions between The Hobbit and the first part of The Lord of the Rings and the rest of The Lord of the Rings is that changes. Yeah. The Hobbit and the first part of The Lord of the Rings are very much like, here's a load of ideas. Let's just chuck them all out there and then kind of ignore some of them later because I think we went too far with that Tom Abomadil fella. So, and then the second part of Lord of the Rings seems to be about, and this is my fantasy world. What do you guys think of it? Yeah, so a lot of people don't know that um, J.R. Tolkien was trying to create English mythology, essentially, um, with the Lord of the Rings. Um, in his the kind of final vision for Lord of the Rings, or for Middle Earth, Middle Earth turns into modern day Earth. It is the same as Asgard and uh, Jotunheim and or whatever the equivalent in Greek mythology would be. It's um, so he wanted to create the first English mythology. I think some people would argue maybe King Arthur is that, but um, he wanted to definitively write it down and have maps to support it and um appendices and uh, the, like the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit are obviously his most famous works, but he has a whole library of stuff set in Middle Earth, expanding the worlds from the first age to the third age. I think the show coming up on Amazon is the second age, which he hasn't written too much about. So they're going to expand that, but that is so closely guarded by the Tolkien estate because it, it, they, he has set out such a definitive working of everything that it's, it's almost impossible to slot something in without it affecting things down the road. Um, and when you think of the time he was doing this in, in a, an era when, you know, it's, it's all essentially from his mind. It's, it's, it's crazy. There's so many languages. Um, it's, it really is just such a comprehensive work of, of fiction. Um, but you're right. He, he did kind of just expand so much beyond the Hobbit, I think is kind of published as a children's story. And then the Lord of the Rings is just, what is this? You know, it's, 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 it's crazy. Oh, well, I had a point. <laughs> no, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. I, I was gone. too busy. I, I was too busy listening. Um, yeah, no, it's gone. Oh, yeah. No, here's what it was. Here's <laughs> what it was. Isn't it interesting? Uh, two points based on what you've just said. Two points these days. These days, if you're writing a fantasy novel and if you're just writing a fan, are you even writing a fantasy novel if you're not, in fact, primarily world building? Because... Like, I don't read that many fantasy novels. I've got to put my hands up. I'm a science fiction person. So fantasy isn't really my thing. But every fantasy novel someone has recommended to me, it's been half a story and half, and this is the world that the whole saga is yeah. going to take place in. And I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, are you, I suppose. Are you even writing a fantasy novel if you're not inventing the languages? <laughs> it's a good... A, a lot of token stands, I'd say, would say you are not... Um, there's a really good video actually by Daniel Green about uh, what if Tolkien was like his worst fans and it's just him jumping down the throat of any future fantasy novelist. Um, but I, I do get what you mean. I suppose you're touching on their high fantasy versus low fantasy. So high fantasy is set completely within its own world. Um, Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings where it's a completely different planet almost. I am, you know, you have your own democracy, everything else that's set up in that world. Low fantasy is basically our world with magical elements put in. So I suppose if I was to recommend, so if, if you are having trouble getting into fantasy because they're all big tomes, I would recommend something that is low fantasy because it's slightly easier to get into the characters and the story of it without actually getting you know, a load of exposition and info dumps about the world. I've never realized how much podcasting is a visual medium. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, doing, I, I, I'm reacting to the implication that I'm not able to read fantasy books because they're too big and there's too many words. For well, me. <laughs> and I'm shaking my fist at you. Ben, you I said know all go the easy words. <laughs> I did not say go easy. I said go easy in the first bit and then that is just <laughs> get comfortable. No, I, I, I know what you mean. It is, a, but I mean, I can get tired of that as well. Um, it, there's nothing worse than a, a fantasy book that's written where someone goes up to a character and is like, hey, what's going on here? And it's like someone has just pressed play on a tape recorder and they just dump a load of info into you. And you're like, oh, God, like, wh why is that there? Um, for my money, one of the best built low fantasy worlds is the Dresden Files, which I've recommended to Ben 
because I think I've amalgamated to you into one person throughout mm, the pandemic. Men. Because I, because I, <laughs> men. <laughs> but um, it starts off as just this very kind of low key kind of detective fiction book, and then like five books later, you're expanding into fairy uh, mythology. You've Norse mythology. You've vampires. You've um gods it's it's and there's 17 books in the series by the 17 book you just realize how fleshed out he's and he's only he's not finished yet you know and um, but they're quite short each book is probably less than 400 pages and yeah it's it's a really interesting just low-key master class in world building for me and the audiobooks are read by spike james masters which is always always good to see oh cool no i can't read though that was i was serious about that <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too worried about for your, <laughs> he can get through them big words for you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so in terms of like that's that's a good recommendation in terms of people who want to jump in i i suppose my introduction to anything fantasy based or would have been low fantasy in the form of neil gaiman yeah um most like, people would be harry potter which is low fantasy yeah I, I guess harry potter is a huge part of it as well and um, so people have jumped on there is there anything you'd recommend for like people looking to make the the jump into into mick can read big books territory or yeah yeah <laughs> yeah if, if michael's looking to take take the plunge i would <laughs> definitely um <laughs> this is a new dynamic i have to say yeah. <laughs> we don't usually gang up on me that's no, not no. usually how it works <laughs> Um, yeah, for anyone looking to start off in high fantasy, I don't think you need to look further than Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn trilogy. Um, they're, they're, it's a very standalone trilogy, which is good. They're long, but not too long. I think they come in around seven, 800 pages. But um, in terms of a fully complete arc for characters, for a really well-developed magic system, um, for a really well-built-out world, um, I, I don't think you need to look further than that. And it kind of, it is adult fantasy, but it's, it's none of it is, um, there's no heavy, hard hitting things in it, I suppose that would, it, you don't need a content warning for anything in it. It's just, it's a really, really fun fantasy world to get into. And if you're looking to kind of explore magic systems or anything like that, I would, I would not look further than that. So what's the name again? It's called uh, the Mistborn trilogy. The first one is called the Final Empire. You can even read the first one as a almost a standalone. It leaves a few threads at the end to allow the second and third book to take place. But uh, if you're looking to give something a go, I would definitely recommend that. How does magic work? Oh, oh, that that was but <laughs> <weird. laughs> um, yeah, I suppose like th this is probably something we could have covered in the history bit. But um, you've two kind of different magic systems you've um a soft mm. magic system this is brandon sanderson again and a hard magic system um so a hard magic system would be something where there's very set rules within the world and uh, Mistborn is a good example of this there's a magic system in that called allomancy which basically means um you inject if you are born with any of these powers you ingest metals and depending on the type of metal you ingest it gives you a different power Ooh. so um if you are, some people are born able to just ingest one metal and they have specific names. And then if you are missed born, you can ingest any of the known metals and use all of the powers. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you ingest steel, you can, I think it's push things. Uh, you can push metals away. If you ingest iron, you can pull metals toward you Ooh. and people can kind of use this to fly. It's, it's, it's a really kind of well fleshed out system. And uh, Brandon Sanderson is probably one of the best for creating hard magic systems. Um, the other version is soft magic, which Lord of the Rings is probably a good example of that. Gandalf is a wizard, but no one really understands what What's he's he doing? doing. Sometimes yeah, he's it's... doing a light. Is he doing a yeah. mind control? What's he yeah. doing? <laughs> you can read into it a bit more with like Tolkien's other works, but to read Lord of the Rings, you're safe to just know Gandalf is a wizard. Um, mm. Harry it's Potter, magic. you could argue, is kind of similar as well. Um, there are rules, but they play hard and fast with them a lot of the time. Um, you, you, like this works on a scale so you can have like a medium magic system but for the main unless it has a hard set of rules it's you just need to know they're wizards just, if you live in that's... that universe and you eat too much tuna mm. and you mercury. ingest a lot of mercury what powers yeah. do you get because in real life <laughs> it just gave me slightly slower reactions and a numb left hand yeah some <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I don't think Mercury is covered actually in his uh he does have a list of medals in the back of the book, uh, mm. if you if you get stuck on any of the, the chapters. But uh, 
Yeah, it's um, yeah. I, I, you must text him. He he tweets regularly. Tweet him about the Mercury. See what he says. I'll tweet him about the Mercury and about the tuna fish. We'll do that. I'm sure he <laughs> we'll hasn't heard that. that. I'm sure I've accidentally stolen that joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh no. We'll we'll give it to you. We'll give it to you. You can have that joke. That's Thanks, for man. you. You you got that one. Mm-hmm. Uh lads, we're gonna have to leave it here. We're we're after we're after filling up that time good and proper. I like I wanted to hear Ben about the differences between self contained fantasy worlds and then the kind of what is probably fairly or unfairly the kind of cheap disposable set in an existing world fantasy because we didn't plan this but connor mentioned that you know day or tolkien's estate has a death grip on the middle earth <laughs> and like you're not you're not writing a book in the middle earth but you can go into any shop and you can find a hundred books in the warhammer universe the dungeons and dragons universe the dragon lance universe i looked it up that's what it is and um, you know there's and there's a difference between those kind of fantasy worlds which are the story, like um, J.R.R. Tolkien, and the fantasy worlds, which are just the setting for a story. And I, I'd like to hear more about that, but perhaps on another podcast. Perhaps we'll do another episode with Connor, if Connor will have us, if he hasn't been too scared away. No, look, I've tickled um, his wickle. He has something to say, Ben. Oh, go on. No, I, I was just going to throw out a little interesting factoid that um, the Tolkien estate actually sued Wizards of the Coast, um, who are the guys who make D&D, over the use of the word hobbit to describe their mini race so they had to change it to halfling mm, so did warhammer i think uh, tolkien had a few butted heads with war with games workshop a few times over orcs as well and goblins yeah and... he's a prickly character sometimes i think um insists his work is not allegory for the war but mm, a little bit racist asked. very clearly is <laughs> uh, no fan of the irish lads no nope. fan of the irish real belittling of our um, mythology he was he used to say um you know, that the British Isles was lacking in, in proper core mythology and people would cough down the back of the room and go, uh, Wales, me. Ireland. Excuse me. <laughs> have you ever heard of, um, have you ever, I don't know why I'm talking, bringing this up. Have you ever heard of the Thymir from Warhammer Fantasy? No. The Thymir are fen and bog dwelling kind of lizard men-esque creatures. Nice. Um, from the depths of time forgotten by the chaos gods and left to wither and die and they they were games workshops attempt to separate their world off from J.R. Tolkien because as you know I'm sure you know the Warhammer fantasy world is Tolkien elves dwarfs good elves mm. slightly woody elves um small orcs called goblin it's it's J.R. Tolkien and they said what can we put in to bloody separate it and they said, let's do the Fimir. And they took the Fimir and they based them on the Fomorians from Irish mythology. No, no way. Mm, mm. We should but probably there... do a bloody episode on that. Yeah, but there was rape. Ah. Oh, yeah, they based, they based the reproductive system of the whole uh, um, of the whole species on kidnapping and raping human women. And oh, then they Jesus. went. Jesus. Now, uh, the good thing was, though, that was in the 80s. And they very quickly, even in the 80s, went, that was a bad oh. idea. No, <laughs> that was a piss Thank poor move. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's just brush them under the carpet. But except for that unfortunate, and that's a huge black mark, obviously. But except for that, it's a great, it was a really interesting concept about bringing Irish mythology in as a way to separate it from <gasps> Tolkien. That's it's good, inter- I like it. It's interesting though as well, like what you're saying there. It, and I suppose Tolkien is widely credited with popularizing elves orcs dwarves they're not his races and i think people do forget that sometimes mm. he didn't create them he 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 had a massive influence over their their popularization but i guarantee you if they were his races a lot more people would be getting sued by the tolkien estate yeah there'd be no warhammer there'd be no there world would, of warcraft 100 yes, percent. there would yeah. be no um any game really would there there'd be yeah. no dragon age origins nothing there would be yeah. no i'm gonna keep going there would be no the witcher <laughs> there would be no anything right i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna jump in there Ben, you've I'm been trying say... to wrap this up for a few minutes now Wait, Sorry, we'll... can i Go just on. say finally i know we were said we were going to do personal recommendations what i can do is i can shoot you guys over a list of just things i would recommend and if you want to throw it on your website or your instagram or whatever and you can pop it up there 
Well, that is the smoothest, butteriest segue that I've ever gotten. We're going to take that list from Connor, and we're going to put it up on our website, www.seomorabeag.com, S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G.com. It means tiny room in Irish. Or, well, also, we're going to throw it up on our Instagram, at seomorabeag, S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G. All right, same spelling. Sorry. <laughs> it's your first day, is it, Ben? I mucked it. I mucked first it. day I'm on sorry. your podcast. I, I got I got excited about content sharing. I was like, ooh. ooh um, uh, yeah, we can also, you can also probably find it uh, bloody uh, up on the Discord. Have you changed the Discord yet, Michael? I have. It's the <laughs> Shelmer Bjorn Discord now. Hop up on it. Get up on the Discord and have a discussion with us. We'll get Connor up there as well and he'll answer all your fantasy questions. Mm. Um... Really? We'll probably have Connor on again for a, a future episode to discuss those questions we didn't get to cover uh, in this one. That's it's a delightful a, idea, Ben. It's yeah. a delightful yeah. idea. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you can join us in a week's Benjamin. time. Yes, what, what, if what, the what? First, If the first fantasy question for Connor isn't, would Batman and Catwoman leave the suits <laughs> on? I'm going to be very disappointed. <laughs> I think you should probably change it to, a, would, would Gimli and Legolas leave their suits on? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that would probably be a, a more logical question they for the fantasy genre. two bros, Ben. Two bros with a with a tacit bond, um. But yeah, look, um, that'll be that. It, join us in a week's time, ladies and gentlemen, where we unfortunately don't have a guest. Oh, oh no guest. Um, it's just the two of us. Uh, where we'll be looking at merciless monster hunters, the best monster hunters, Ooh. uh, throughout bloody throughout bloody popular culture. Oh, I'm gonna um, look at Hansel and Gretel. Yeah, it's gonna be good. You're gonna have to watch that. We're gonna have to watch Van Helsing with one Hugh Jackman. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, so we're going to get a lot of that. Wolverine with a hat. Um, so it's going to be great. We're going to get to see all that. Um, so we'll talk to you then. Thanks a million, Connor, for coming on. And, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Listen to us just just, just hammer you with questions and <laughs> you know, references to strange events in the popular culture world. Um, that's it. You don't have anything you want to plug there, do you? You're not on social media or anything no, like that. No, I, I, I don't use social media. So if anyone has any complaints about what I've said, please at Ben. <laughs> just directly <laughs> at Ben. Yeah. yeah. You can I find do. us on Twitter at Listenshur. Started um, with that you can... jerk who was on your podcast or something. I'll okay. <laughs> we'll find way um, Anyway, that's it from us for this week. Ladies and gentlemen, bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.